Uh, good morning all, uh, respected Dean Sir, uh, Mehta Madam, uh, Dr. O Sir and uh, our guests uh, and dear friends. Uh, under uh, Ages of Medical Humanities Division of KM Hospital, I welcome you all here for today's program on uh, Poetry and Science. It's a little uh, different uh, program. We are going to look at uh, science from poetic point of view or poetic lens and uh, uh, their views on uh, health, sciences and the interface between arts and science. Our division was started uh, last year. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Manu Kothari, who was our uh, ex uh, head of the department of uh, anatomy and uh, one of the dearest teachers this institute has ever had, and uh, an excellent human being, an orator par excellence. Uh, I think uh, his name being associated with this medical humanities was the best thing that could happen to our division. Dr. Sunil Pandya is our uh, Chair of Medical Humanities. Unfortunately, he is not able to come and attend today's event. But uh, I would like you all to enjoy this uh, morning's uh, discourse. Uh, I hand over the mic to Sanket. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would actually request everybody to kind of come right to the front so that uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, we will now begin this session which is very aptly titled Poetry and Science. Good morning ladies and gentlemen, lovers of poetry and imagination, believers of science and reason. Friedrich von Schlegel, noted German writer and critic, once said, if you want to penetrate into the heart of physics, then let yourself be initiated into the mysteries of poetry. Victor Hugo draws an even more undeviating parallel between the two when he says, astronomy has its clear side and its luminous side. On its clear side, it is tinctured with algebra, on its luminous side, with poetry. Or James Russell Lowell, who in his literary essay Witchcraft, published in 1868, says in the earliest ages, science was poetry, as in the latter, poetry has become science. Aren't scientists poets combining atoms and elements, just like words, to create a new way of life? Aren't poets social scientists combining words and imagination to create a new way of life? And yet, we are faced with an indefinable question. Is poetry and science the same or are they different? This very question unites us all today. Today we have our distinguished luminaries who stand on the cusp of poetry and science. We have Sylvia Geist, Anita Thampi and Shri Swami and our moderator for this session, Dr. Sanjay Ok. I will begin with a round of introductions now. And as I introduce, I would request all the dignitaries to come and take the place on the stage. <coughs> Our first speaker, Sylvia Geist, comes from Berlin. She studied chemistry, German studies and art history at the Technical University of Berlin. She delves into poetry, prose and translates works from English. Her language is characterized by a mix of linguistic styles that draws a parallel between pathos and brevity. She believes in writing with a precision of scholarly denotation, describing the agitation of vernacular and lastly, bringing in extreme condensation through the language of poetry. I please request Sylvia Geist to take her stage. <laughs> uh, 
Our second speaker comes from Kerala. Anita Thampi, a Malayalam poet with three collections to her credit. Her first book, Muttamati Kumbal, also known as Sweeping the Front Yard, published in 2004, was chosen as the best poetry book of the year by the influential Malayalam newspaper, Matru Bhumi. The dynamic tension between the self and the universe, the individual's subjective consciousness against a vast, impersonal expanse of external reality lies at the heart of all her poetry. I request Anita Thampi to please take her stage. Our third speaker is Sridhar Swami. Sridhar Swami is a poet, essayist and photographer. Her first collection of poems, A Reluctant Survivor, published in 2007 by Sainti Academy. Sridhar has written four books for children, published in 2009 and 2012. She was a 2011 Charles Wallace Writer in Residence at the University of Stirling, Scotland and Fellow of the International Writing Programme at the University of Iowa, 2013. I would request Sridhar to be the master. And now comes the moderator who very modestly said that please do not introduce me at all. So I just keep with his request and I request Dr. Sanjay Oak to please come on stage. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Gwalani who will be a part of this session as well. So I please request you to come on stage. I now request Dr. Rook to take over this session and begin with this discourse. Thank you. Good morning, dear friends. Honorable Dean, Dr. Gwalani, my dear poet friends, Sylvia, Anita, Sridhala, my colleague from Nair, Dr. Kanak Nagle, head of cardiac surgery and a poet. Dear friends, coming to KM has always been a homecoming to me. And that's the reason I scheduled my work at Prince Ali Khan today at 7.30 a.m. so that I am taught at 11 o'clock. And never be bothered by the empty chairs of MLT because I always say that in Kurukshetra when Bhagavad Gita was narrated, Arjuna was the only listener. But Krishna did it for one listener. So there is no reason, Sylvia, why we should not do it for any other audience, is it? That's it. Poetry and science seem like two opposites. But the two have long been intertwined with each other. So today, coming to KEM, in addition to becoming a homecoming, was a joyous occasion. There are rare occasions when I come to KEM for a meeting of minds for a change. And there are still rarer occasions that I now visit KEM, not for a surgical scalpel, but for a meaningful metaphor. There's a wonderful poem. This comes from Prasun Zushi, a name which is known to all of us in India. And I'm just going to say, in few lines, what he has described, what a poem means to life. This is in Hindi, and it goes, Kya samaj ko jagana hai kavita? Kya samaj ko jagana hai kavita? Ya kuch batana, kuch chupana? Bin kahe kuch kahe jana? Sab kuch kahe jana? क्या ये है कविता या फिर संवेदना के दीपक को शब्दों के होर से तूफानों से बचाना है कविता या इतिहास जिसे भुला दे राजनीति जिसे नजरअंदाज कर दे उस मासूम से सत्य को जीवित रखना है कविता शायद और भी बहुत कुछ है कविता पर अगर सरलता से सोचे तो शायद दो कड़ी ठहर कर जिंदगी की नदी को बहते हुए देखते जाना है क्या बात है प्रसन्न जोशी इज अ ब्रिलियंट यंग फ्रॉम इंडिया 
He writes for most of the blockbuster movies. What he talks about poetry is that what is a poetry? Is it reliving your past? It is daydreaming your future? Is it getting to the forefront the things that the politicians would love to forget? Is it giving a common person a hope to live and aspire and achieve something in life? What is eventually a poetry? And he ends saying that life is like a river which is taking undulating swipes and just observing the way it goes. That is poetry. That's what he says. Dear friends, today we have all assembled to pause, ponder and think about, we may say, flirtation of poetry and science and how deep that particular romance is. Do you know how deep that romance is? In the late 1700 scientific treaties, I mean the publications, the Lancet, BMZ things that we keep on doing today, all the initial scientific treaties were written in a poetic form. And poetry was considered as a language of intellect and future. In 1800, Lewis Carroll experimented with mathematical logic to create the famous The Square Stanza and then Dante's The Divine Comedy. In 1984, there was a paper, The Detection of Shock Company by physicist Z.W.V. Story. And this was published in the Proceedings of Astronomical Society of Australia. And believe me, in a scientific journal, peer-reviewed index journal, the article was a 38th stanza poem. The critics add, much to the irritation of his colleagues and the saddest pleasure of the scientist. <laughs> Poetry, dear friends, helps science. It holds the hands of science to go beyond boundaries and barriers. Today, there are poets who embrace and explore both the confirmed and the working theories of physics, astronomy and nature. Dr. Kanak Nagli, my colleague from Naya, CBTS A. Like Kanak Nagli, occasionally I do write poetry and I have two books of poetry to my credit. But they have science as a background. Does that imply that there is a different interplay between distinct areas of our brain? That at one stage we are operating and at other stage we are either writing, reciting or narrating poetry. Do we need to have different areas of brain? Let's go back to our first year and I'm reminded of our dear Manu sir here. Researchers at the Uni University of Exeter conducted functional MRIs on people who read some poetry to try to identify which area of the brain is responsible. And they found that it was the right side of brain and the cingulate gyrus that was responsible for both these activities. Interestingly, this is also the area that sends shivers to the spine. Frontiers in Neurology reported that expression of science through poetry could enrich better understanding in a class. And you all remember the various poem or the small acronyms that we used to do right from first and previous second term to remember the ligaments and tendons and insertions on the medial aspect and lateral aspect of food. But Dr. Gwalani, John Keats was a surgeon at you and me. He was a trained surgeon in 1700 and he died and remembered not as a surgeon but as a poet. So this one small contribution comes from John Kitts and who says, looking at a rainbow, there was an awful rainbow once in heaven, we know her woof, her texture she is given in the dull catalogue of common things. Dear friends, poetry is nothing different. But when you start seeing things by just not your optic cortex or occipital lobes, but also with your gyra and sulci in place behind it. A common myth is that science ruins the beauty of things. 
by dissecting it into the components. It's in fact just a myth, as you will understand today, that all of them who have either a background of arts or science can narrate their experiences and their life in poetry. Poetry has meters, science has methods. Science deals with hypothesis, poetry with humanity. Poetry sees the unseen, science explores the unknown. All poetry is not a romantic lie, neither is all science a gospel truth. Instincts add values to science, interpretation gives it the dimension that it deserves and ideas emerge out of poetry that drives the science. So dear friend, when the organizers approached me in Prince Ali Khan hospital as to sir would you do this? I said yes, but in KEM. Why in KEM? I miss Dr. Manu Kothari today and I feel as if he is standing and singing his famous Kisi ki muskura hatao I can't think of a better place than KEM where science meets humanity. Sylvia, this is the place which trains doctors of tomorrow of India and we are all proud of being students of this particular place. This is the place where science and surgery touch CDMAT. And therefore, this has to be the place where pragmatism should whisper poetry. Dear friends, come for the next one hour. Let's all, in our own words, inspect, palpate, percuss, and ascultate <laughs> and explore the unchanted vistas to touch the unmade horizons of poetry and science. I am now going to request Sylvia to present her views and then sing the famous poem that you wish to convey. What I have in mind is each one of you speak, convey your one or two poems and then I am going to request Dr. Nagle and there are very bright young students and staff members from this place. I have been a dean and director of this place for four years, looked at the wonderful product of magazines which this college brings up and there are sections on poetry when bright young students to the staff members explore themselves and express themselves in poetic romance. How wonderful when one first year student of medicine who dissects a human body from my hospital once wrote that the best friend that I have got till today is the dead body which I dissect. That is poetry in day to day world. Sylvia, it's all yours. Please come.
common root of uh, poetry and science, um, we find it in the word techne, in the uh, old uh, Grecian word techne, which meant um, science as well as art. It was uh, a common word for both of them. And uh, for me, it became uh, a prominent um, topic uh, when I tried to break free from my individual uh, concerns and worries and I thought, okay, what, uh, can, what can I do to escape some uh, boundaries uh, or, or some mental limits? <coughs> and uh, I, 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 I didn't uh, write about myself anymore, or I thought uh, I, I won't. And, uh, because um, I had studied chemistry before, one day I had a look on the periodic table and uh, in that depiction uh, I had uh, in front of my eyes, it looked as if the, uh, the single elements were depicted as a poem because any shift in the inner of the atom uh, was uh, a line or seemed to be a line and any electron in that shift seemed to be a word. And so uh, I, I got the idea, okay, uh, this is a form I can try to work with. I have a certain number of words I am allowed to, to use for a stanza and I have a content and I have something to tell about and this is the element itself. What can it do? What uh, qualities has it? Uh, and um, then I, I start to write some poems about um, chemical elements based on the shape of the periodic table. But meanwhile, of course, um, I have to confess um, I didn't succeed in matters of breaking free of myself because I discovered that I, I brought my uh, inner life uh, in the poetry too, in this um, chem chemical poetry too. So uh, these poems uh, are also individual and in a certain way they became my uh, personal pharmacy, let's say, because uh, any element has uh, particular qualities and capabilities and of course dangers and risks and options what you can do with. And um, many elements are parts of our bodies and uh, without them we, we could be we could stay alive, we could not come to life at all. And uh, so it is, uh, it is not that abstract, I think, that it sounds. And uh, <laughs> maybe I just read uh, two of these um, poems and uh, my colleague in French, Fredana, will be like, friendly to read it in an uh, English translation. So the poems are in German language. Yeah. In German, and then we have an English translation. Fine. Yeah, sure. because it is a little bit uh, um, uh, sound in it um, too, and so it might be um, nice to hear it in the original language too. Sure. Calcium, Rückgrat, ja, Zähne, ja, auch die autistischen Nägel, ja, ja, Kürze, die man merkt, sobald es gericht und die ergeben werden, gewesen ist dein Gesicht, mein Herz, zaghaftes, 
verheiltes, allerlei rau. Weich entrollt das Nesselsägeblatt seine Botschaft an die Wirbel. Nimm doch den Löwenzahn ein, Mehltau von Stärke zuerst, ja. Aber zermahlen Brot süß, etwas Geteiltes, die Entfaltung morgens, wenn wir aufrecht liegen. Calcium. Backbone, yes. Teeth, yes. And the autistic nails, yes, yes. Signs we only notice when affliction strikes and they're given up. Is past, your face, my heart, tentative healed farago. Softly the nettle saw blade unfurls its message to the spine. So take the dandelion tincture. Mildew of starch at first, then crushed bread sweet, something shared, mornings unfolding as we lie up straight. So the next poem, uh, Calcium, is, is very uh, common and we, uh, all of us know it, of course. The next poem is about um, a rare metal, uh, iridium. And uh, yeah, it is about the, the, the rareness, actually, of something. Iridium. Einmal angenommen, es ginge um etwas anderes. Es ginge seltener als Gold, um selteneres als das. Um etwas, worin man es aufbewahrte, wäre es nicht widersinnig, Gold aufzubewahren seltenerem als Gold. Es ginge nur einmal angenommen um Kugelschreiber, Sonnenbrillen, federnde Mechaniken, Dinge so, so wenig selten wie Wasser oder Licht, widersinnige Dinge, die es in sich haben, Spuren sind von seltenem, ohne dass man es wüsste, Dinge, die nicht enttäuschen, nur in zwei gehen können und trotzdem aufbewahrt würden weil sie nicht selten nur Geschenke wären, wie Momente, Zwecklosigkeiten, die man einmal angenommen behielte, Spuren nicht von Momenten oder eines seltenen Moments, vielmehr von viel mehr, weil sie Seltenes nur keinen einzigen Moment aufbewahren. Angenommen, es ginge einmal um gar keinen seltenen Moment noch um die unsagbar vielen einzigen Momente, nur um das viele eines unabsehbaren Moments, einen, den man, wenn man ihn behielte, wieder erhielte, weil er einen bewahrte, wie nicht seltene Dinge, selteneres aufbewahren können, Kugelschreiber, Sonnenbrillen, Spuren davon sind, Federn sind, einer Mechanik seltener als Gold. Und es ginge nicht wieder, wie in dem Moment, als man einmal eintrat in eine nicht so seltene Zone aus Wasser und Licht, wo man es nicht mehr sah, nur wusste, man wäre angenommen. Nicht selten, nur Feder in einer Mechanik, die einen behielte, weil man es in sich hätte, sich zu bewahren, einzig weil sie einen enthielte, ginge es einmal anders. Iridium. Just assuming it were about something else, it were rarer than gold, something rarer than that something in which it's kept safe, were it not paradoxical to keep gold in something rarer than gold? Involving, let's assume, ballpoint pens, sunglasses, springs and mechanisms, things as little rare as water or light, paradoxical things that have something about them are traces of rareness without anyone ever knowing things which do not disappoint, can only break apart, yet would be kept because they were not rare, just gifts like moments' aimlessnesses that once accepted we'd cling to not traces of moments or one rare moment, but more of much more because they preserve rareness, not just for a single moment, assuming it were not about a rare moment at all, nor the unforeseeably many single moments, 
but the manyness of one unforeseeable moment that could be repeated because we'd held on to it as things not rare can hold rarer <coughs> things. Ballpoints, sunglasses, its traces are springs, are of a mechanism rarer than gold and unrepeatable as in that moment we once walked into a zone that's not so rare, made of water and light, where we could no longer see it but only know we were accepted not rare but just springs in a mechanism that contained us because we could contain ourselves only because it contained us were it different for once. That was uh, truly wonderful, and uh, I, uh, the compliments are also due to Sridhara for translating this. No, I didn't translate it. I just read it. You out. just read it. Someone translated it. Because the trans, yeah. See, the translation of poetry has its own beauty, and that is a point that I want to get for my young uh, graduates. We all feel like we are in medicine, we are in surgery, and. This is miles beyond. We have left arts behind in 10 standard. No, you could begin by translating wonderful things into your own mother tongue. It could be Hindi, it could be Gujarati, it could be English. Brilliant concept. Can I get it to my local language? That should be your first endeavor. That should be your first effort. Just persist with that. Catch hold of your buddy when you are having a bada pav across the road. Listen to what I have written. Beyond green item and you know, other things that we uh, rattle around. That's the beginning of the poet within you. It's an acorn which is one day going to go into a big oak, you know. And that is possible by making a good beginning. I now move to uh, Anita. Anita, correct me if I'm wrong. You are a mechanical engineer? Oh, listen that. Say it lovely, please. It's on. Yeah, uh, I have I'm graduated uh, in engineering, chemical engineering, I'm a bit of, and then I went on to do my MTech in technology and development in IIT Bombay and then a PhD in solid based management from IIT Bombay. IIT Bombay, chemical engineering, then MTech and then PhD. Better than FBS. <laughs> Right, so if I may ask you, how did you start? What was your first poetic expression in your career? Because otherwise we feel like, oh, chemical engineering and you know, all those molecules and atoms and hexan and benzene rings, to us everything looks alike. How did you start with poetry? It was not like I got started, it was with me naturally from my childhood. And I was inspired um, perhaps from the poems which I didn't have um, a poetic background or anything in my family. I come from a very middle class ordinary family where no one wrote. Uh, my father was a political worker so the house was always crowded. There was nothing like someone sitting alone, reading, romanticizing, writing, nothing. So, um, so when I went to school, you know, from the first standard, second standard, itself uh, there were poems from masters and as I read uh, I felt that uh, this was different and it was like a door opened to another world there was uh, magic which I couldn't understand completely at that time but I could connect so from that time onwards I kept writing I used to write from a very early age in my life so there was no breaking that Parallelly, I continued my education as usual. And then you continued in uh, Matru Bhumi, which is a very reputed newspaper. Not really. I graduated and I joined a um, company. It's a you, factory. You started a job. Shop floor in yeah. a company. Yeah. With people, I work with machines. I, I was working as an engineer. Matru Bhumi is just a newspaper and somehow it... Uh, my first collection was recognized by them and somehow it got into my bio and it keeps uh, coming, uh, yeah. coming like everywhere. Okay. It's not that important. So what are the messages that you just hear my young friends coming from a house which was busy with political activity, no separate corner or a writer's you know, balcony or corner or something like that, not requiring a Sheffield or Monte Carlo, 
एक अढ़ाई रुपया वाला पेन चलता है या कुछ नहीं लगता एनी काइंड ऑफ पेपर बिलीव मी माई बेस्ट ऑफ द आर्टिकल्स आर रिटर्न ऑन द वो जो होटल में जब चेक इन करते हैं तो वो जो लेटर हेड रहता है ना आई हैव कलेक्शन ऑफ ऑल लेटर हेड अक्रॉस इंडिया एंड यू राइट द बेस्ट ऑफ योर पीसेस यू नेवर नो वेन आइडिया हिट्स यू इट कुड बी इन द फ्लाइट इट कुड बी वाई यू आर ड्राइविंग इट कुड बी वेन यू आर जस्ट लुकिंग आउटसाइड अ कैप एंड समथिंग हिट्स यू एंड यू राइट अ पॉइंट और यू राइट एन ए से डियर फ्रेंड्स इट्स अ क्रिएटिव माइंड दैट किप्स सर्विंग अप अगेन एंड अगेन टू एक्सप्रेस एंड दैट इज वॉट ईच वन ऑफ यू हैव गॉट The very fact that you have joined KEM that means you are 99.99 percent, and that too in an era of CET. Believe me, Urmi, my colleague has been here, Nitya has been here. Urmi, Nitya, if we were born in CET era, we would not have been sitting in this hall very clearly. So these guys are sitting. That means you have that basic energy and intellectual level. It's just that you have to commit yourself. Anita, can I request you to say one of your poems, that the one that is close to you? Anything? um my poem my poem you yeah. oh. i just can't say shall i go yeah please you which are you are comfortable rather than my poem uh, when i when i knew i was going to come to a hospital for a reading but um came to my mind um, is to introduce uh, a poet whom i love is a check point uh, his name is miroslav miroslav holub uh, h o l u b you might be knowing because he was a doctor uh, just as silvia said godfrey ben is there miroslav holub is an internationally known poet and uh, he is the most one of the most important poets of czech language and uh, he is a poet's poet godfrey ben also is a poet's poet maybe people who are from science when they write and they write well they end up being the writer's writer we should think about it why it is so so i am so tempted to read a poem of holub who my love to you uh, maybe after which i can read a poem if time allows uh, i actually copied it uh, to read here a few lines from the the poems the festival he writes at the festival of the patients with all the non diseases the crutch coil scenes for the pacemakers the double astigmatic landscape gratefully swallows the murmurs of the mitral valve it goes on like that the point is he has often drawn metaphors from his profession from what he did and there is uh, a point casualty which he, all of you will be i hope will be able to identify with which i will read casualty they bring us crushed fingers mentit doctor they bring out burnt out eyes haunted owls of hearts they bring a hundred white bodies a hundred red bodies a hundred black bodies mentit doctor on the dishes of ambulances they bring the madness of blood the scream of flesh the silence of charming mentit doctor and while we are suturing inch after inch night after night nerve to nerve muscle to muscle eyes to sight they bring in even longer daggers even more dangerous bombs even more glorious victories it dates so that is uh, the poem which i wanted to introduce and actually mirrors that the poem has uh, Said, uh, he was given by the academy of writers he was asked to take a break from his profession as a doctor we would give you stipend equivalent to your two years salary so just dedicate yourself to poetry he said no i love science and if i were given all the time and money to completely write poetry i'm not sure if i would write poetry at all so that's what he said and he said he has two ways of seeking truth one was science and the other was poetry so so introducing the poet to you i think uh, i have indirectly expressed what's in my mind as well on these two topics i don't think these are different and as a practitioner of science someone who has been trained in science and technology and has been practicing it all through 
drawing, trying to draw from my experience, looking back, of course. Uh, uh, what I feel is that um, my training in science and technology has perhaps helped me to <coughs> seek, you know, precision when I write, brevity, clarity. That's what I feel. And on the other hand, uh, you know, you must be knowing that we are trained, engineers especially are trained to find problems and to find solutions. So we are solution seekers and poetry has no solution, you know, poetry is not something which offers solutions, but we are trained to try always looking for solutions. I must solve this problem, sort of thing. So that is, that, that's what I have tried to resist when I write poetry. It's not a good thing to, because so many problems are related to that solution seeking mindset which I am not going into in detail. So that's it and I'll read a poem of mine if that allows and I will. I write in Malayalam, uh, I do write in English. Uh, the title of this poem is Fruit As It Is. Uh, Fruit As It Is, Kalche Padi. It's a, it's a brief poem, it's a small poem. I read in Malayalam. Even if you don't understand, the, let the language ring. Padam Varapu Kari, Chakka Padamal Varakinu, Plan Chilli, Vere, Kaichapadi, Pen Tadi, Mulakalai, Ruba Kalpana Chaydala, Murivum Turavumai, May Pilapogalal Allah, Rend the Nimishan Hunter, Amachi Vakatiyal, Murichi Vecha Matta, Gurum Tarai, Madal Chakini, Chulagal, Guru, Tenuna Pola, Vere Vere Varachitilla. Mulli Tanna Panita Mujuven Mie Pedna Ditti Peri Nigaruni Chuvada Tudacha Nina Tutti Pidikim Karayai Planchoti Vina Ayogi Mulakim Vitai Elada Parekum Manamai Padamal Vareka of the Pendamal Nokum Nedam Sherikim Plangadil Patichirna Padamalai I will read the English translation, Fruit as it is. It is done, the translation is done by Dr. <coughs> C.S. Venkateshwar. This poem is taken off from a painting which I have seen. She who paints draws jackfruits on the branches of the jackfruit tree and on the roots just as they are, not fashioned as breasts of the female trunk. Not as split body parts, as openings and wounds, but as if two minutes ago mother had cut as if two minutes ago mother had cut in two halves with a knife and laid it on bare floor. Its skin, innards, flesh, seeds, the slippery seed husks, each not drawn separately, the body fully built in thorns. A burden a woman straightening herself bears. The sticky stain that refuses to be erased. The seed that falls at the foot of the jackfruit tree that rots and sprouts. The smell that spreads all around. When women who do not paint look, when women who do not paint look, with babies growing inside their bellies, they see fruits for real stuck to the jackfruit tree trunk. Thank you. Wonderful, that, that, uh, lovely. Dear friends, uh, it's not it's not that only in India, in Mumbai, in KM today we are doing this kind of exercise. Just last year. Yale University School of Medicine and University College London Medical School had a sponsored program and that was a contest for medical students and postgraduates like this, like what you are. And you know which was the best poem that was selected and the poem's title was Mastectomy. There are poems, there are nearly about 200 poems, 200 plus I would say, on mastectomies done by the patients done by the kith and kin and you know all across the world whether it is India whether it is overseas the moon has been used abused and overused by poets <laughs> I mean once I was having a, a chat with Guljarji at the time of one of my books 
and I asked him, what makes you feel as if sometimes you are chand, usne chand parosa tha. Abhi chand kya hai? Aamti hai. So parosa chand hai. Yeah, in another poem, he has come out and said, Mujhe thukar lagi kaise chand raste mein pada tha. Kya dada ka dhabba hai? Iska rakha kar. But then I was surprised when I was reading a poem on mastectomy and the poet said, once the moon had a mastectomy. Wonderful expressions of a patient who has undergone a radical ma modified mastectomy, no clearance. And she comes up with ideas saying that, oh, I'm not without breast, I'm only flat chested now. And it's like from the sky, the moon has been taken away. Along, and along with that, small stars in the nearby vicinity are also gone. What a wonderful way of depicting the apical nodal clearance in a mastectomy. This is a way, the pain, the anguish, the sorrow, that feeling of helplessness and being all alone can be expressed. And dear friends, the whole purpose of this exercise today of doing it in KEM is to bring it to your notice that such exercises also happen all over the world. You never know what gets you a residency apart from your ECFMG and MLE scores. It could be one of such facets that finds you a place in a good college. Mind my words. Now, that, brings me, that, that brings me to the titles of other two poems also, who won the awards there. One was Apices and the second was Aphasia. So the neurologist and psychiatrist can never be far away. <laughs> I now come to see the lab. Dear friend, you know, what a wonderful, I mean, someone introduced her very briefly. But Sridhala, tell me right, Sridhala Swami is a poet, an essayist, and a photographer. Am I right? Very occasionally, uh, but I am forced to be one. Right? <laughs> but her, her, her contributions were published by Sahitya Academy. And something, like we guys look at, uh, you know, Johns Hopkins or uh, Mayo Clinic fellowships and things like that. On the side of the arts, she is a recipient and her second book was under the aegis of Jahangir Sabawala Foundation and that's a big achievement here friends. She has written four books for children. So welcome to the gathering. And I want, I have a personal wish. I am enthralled by the title of one of the poems. It scrolls to us. You know what the title is? The title is Postmortem. Yeah. Uh, good almost afternoon everyone, thank you for being here and uh, you know th uh, there are some very specific things uh, that get left out of a general bio because it's not relevant to every place that you read and uh, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be in a teaching hospital like KEM because uh, I have had the privilege of reading at both the Aga Khan Hospital at Karachi and at the St. John's Hospital in Bangalore. And uh, with my friend, the writer and surgeon Kaveri Nambishan, uh, we have uh, used a grant from the University of Iowa to promote uh, humanities in medical education at St. John's, which already has a humanities department. Um, so. Uh, and to all of you sitting over here, I don't need to explain uh, the uses of the humanities in a medical education because I can see you're here for the poetry, so I'll get down to it. Um, you know, the best place to observe and humanity and all kinds of people I have found from experience is in a hospital waiting room. You will see all kinds of people over there patients, attendants, and a variety of uh, everyday occurrences in the midst of great psychological and physical pain. And there is so much poetry in it that you can write entire collections. I will share with you just two of those poems that came out of it. Um, not, not as a patient myself, but as a person who spent a lot of time in hospitals as attendants. And that's something that happens to everyone at some point in their life. Uh, I will read the poem that Dr. Oak wanted me to read. So I will read Postmortem first. 
postmortem. The brain in its jar floats in dreams, streams of memory, consciousness preserved. The two halves, like breasts, grieve for the softness of skin, for the reserved whisper of touch. All this has already happened and will never happen again. The brain curls itself up, hits glass, ricochets and remembers. Fetal, an echo of shape, a pearl of desire. His body holding the other one that burnt away and became ember. There should be a question here, a how or a why, a way to understand linearities. Instead, there are ridges and convolutions, the repetition of blood beating, the raising of hair along an arm when finger follows vertebrae down the spine. Brain, body, umbilicus. Our bodies stretch within and without to accommodate life, but without you, without you, without you, I am only a dissonance, an object adrift, a wretched longing for the pain of being alive. In my first collection, I had a long, um, uh, 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 probably one of the longest poems I've written called Hospital Catalogues, which of course came out of the experience of sitting in those waiting rooms that I had mentioned. Um, this one in the second collection kind of finishes that series. So this is called Hospital Catalogues, Coda. This time when we're in casualty, he cries but says nothing, sheds no tears but his shoulders shake with dry sobs. This is a routine we know well now. Weight, oxygen saturation, x-ray on the way up, attendant passes, an advance paid. The medicines the nurses bring, just enough for today and tomorrow. The toilet is always too far away. Tomorrow, my mother prays. Tomorrow, let him be. She cries in the bathroom with the shower on. Says tears have medicinal properties. Does she mean therapeutic? She cannot shoulder the burden of words in addition to all else. No way to keep at bay the one word she dreads. I know the one she's thinking of. I try to avoid it, but I know when I see the doctor promising to discharge him tomorrow if he will be good today and eat well, that this is one way to tell us not to hope. What hope when every night he cries, Mudiliye, Mudiliye. His left shoulder slanted downward in pain. For that, no permitted medicine. No cure, that is what they should tell us. Throw out the medicines, the inhalers, nebulizers, injections, tablets, sachets. Let his tongue know the taste of food again. He says to me, my shoulder hurts, can you massage it? Every day I think, tomorrow he will get better. Then, if he cannot get better, let him not get worse. I cry. <coughs> At other times, I chant to myself, there must be a way. His doctor discharges him, makes sure he gets away. Later, I will thank him for this. As he leaves, his medicine bags weigh nearly as much as he does. I exaggerate, a far cry from the truthfulness I demanded earlier. Everybody knows, at least I think they do, that if there is a tomorrow, it is not one that will be pleasant. I dream that night of shoulders carrying a beer and on it my father. His shoulders, once so broad they could carry our anxieties lightly, are way too thin. He is all bones, all skin. What is left for tomorrow to take? I wake up. It's 7.30. Time for his medicines. We turn the light on. I hear the oxygen hiss. I already know what we will see. I know for certain when I hear her cries. In the days that follow, we cry very little. Our shoulders become broader than before. We find our own ways to comfort, and we know words we didn't before. Tomorrow and after, we will avoid hospitals and hate medicines as before. as if you
you spent some years with us in the corridors of the hospital. Dear friends, Barna Bhai Chaudhary, one of the best poets that this soil ever produced. In Marathi wrote in just two lines, Ki Deva Tuza Sagra Vegra Se Tantara Zagana Manju Phatta Jeevan Maranathla Don Sasansa Antar. It is just a distance of two prints between being alive and being named as a body number so and so. And how many times KEM gives us that opportunity? How many times you hear the first cry in the labor ward on the ground floor of our extension building? How many times when we walk across the corridor from the dean's office to our RMO quarters maze going around ward number 3, ward number 4, ward number 5? Aruna's unsaid words still keep haunting back to my mind and memory. This is poetry. Dear friends, this is poetry. And today now I'm going to invite one of my colleagues, my best trusted allies, Dr. Kanak Nagle. Dr. Nagle heads cardiac surgery department of Naya Hospital. And when I was planning this program, I telephoned him and said, Kanak, please do come over. You know, as a surgeon, I can operate one baby, correct his congenital anomaly. Nagle can operate one heart, correct one ASD, VSD, prepare a wall, do a bypass. We need sternotomies for this, isn't it? Through poetry and through a good essay, you can repair the hearts of millions of fellow beings without doing a sternotomy. Therefore, pain is mightier than a surgical scalpel. Not yet. मात्र खाना तुझात मिलावा 
यासाठी चित्रगुप्ताकडेच करतो अर्ज यासाठी चित्रगुप्ताकडेच करतो अर्ज आणि सर इफ यू परमिट मी आय आय जस्ट रिसाईट अ स्मॉल पॉईंट बिकॉज यू ऑल्सो नो द कधी किती असं वाटतं की त्या ऑपरेशन रूममधल्या नाईनपेक्षा या माईकचं इंटॉक्सिकेशन जास्त असतं एकदा आलं की सोटत नाही तो असं वाटतं बोलत राहा बोलत राहा आणि ऑडियन्स असे झाले की वाटतं परत बोलत राहा पण टाईम तर कन्सिडर तरी मी एक एक आता वाचतो असं जे आपल्या याचं शीर्षक आहे अँब्युलन्स आज परत अँब्युलन्सचा सायरन वाजला आज परत अँब्युलन्सचा सायरन वाजला इतक्या वेळा ऐकून हा आवाज परिचित झाला सर्वांना वाटते कुतुहल या आवाजाचे सर्वांना वाटतं कुतुहल या आवाजाचं माझं मात्र याचं जवळशी नातं माझं मात्र याच्याशी जवळचं नातं धावपळ सर्वांची सुरू झाली आत धावपळ सर्वांची सुरू झाली आत सर्व सज्ज झाले करण्यासाठी मृत्यूवर मात मृत्यूवर आजपर्यंत केली मात कोणी मृत्यूवर आजपर्यंत केली मात कोणी जीवन मरणाची गाठ बांधली येते जन्माला आलो घेऊन सोबत दोन गोष्टी जन्माला आलो घेऊन सोबत दोन गोष्टी मरणाची शाश्वती व सावलीची सोपते जीवनाने केले शेवटी अर्पण मरणाला जीवनाने केले शेवटी अर्पण मरणाला सावलीने शेवटपर्यंत सोडले नाही मला सावलीने शेवटपर्यंत सोडले नाही मला धन्यवाद How how beautifully expressed. I mean, in surgical practice, we do come across patients who ask us, "Doctor, sir, hundred percent guarantee hai to bolo." And a very ruthless I answer them that the only guaranteed thing in life is death. But that's what you said in the most poetic manner that one day that's going to happen, and just celebrate the life by doing poetry, by writing good essays, reciting them, and reliving beyond the surgical life. I'm now going to invite the young students of KM Hospital. and the first one to come is priyashri desai is priyashri there please do come and priyashri you want to read it on behalf of dr torgaonga am i right please uh good afternoon everybody um rise light the fire deep within nurture it let it burn bright the only way to beat the dark is to become the light begin now as you are take a single step ahead let the world unfold before you the earth shake beneath your tread you are the chains that bind yourself the weight on your back spread your wings and you break free rise and don't look back from the ashes from the suit be the flame that glows as once by the lord's voice kind light from the dark arose fall once and then once again but through the trials and the pain he is with you his hand take his hand rise and rise again you are the flame of love of hope light that cannot die by his love and by his grace rise phoenix and fly thank you brilliant priyashri and keeping with the tradition of the new generation you you were paperless and you read it from your mobile android screen that's next time when we conduct this session we will have a head of displays in the air in front of us akanksha shreya akanksha please good afternoon everyone thank you for coming here the title of my poem is noisy times quiet times and here i begin a small town nestled in the hills famous for its cotton mills i was born in this place as with my parents was the case i spent my childhood with my friends wandering among the hills setting new trends we rode horses we climbed trees we tasted limes those were the times the noisy times I grew up as time flew by when my friends left I had a good cry in the big white church to place my marriage I was given away in a blue carriage I had two children who were the apple of my eyes 
They were good and sweet and had witty replies. I loved them a lot, which is hardly a crime. Those were the times, the noisy times. I watched them go with my eyes blurred. Now it's just me and my husband in our seventies with our backs bent. A small town nestled in the hills, famous for its cotton mills. This is the place where I started. This is the place where I will end the life I had. About my life, I can now write a hundred rhymes. For these are the times, the quiet times. Thank you. Rohaksha, what I like, I like a youngster saying that till 70, me and my husband will be together, though the bags will be bent, and this is the place that will get us back. That's the spirit, that's what we want. Diksha Singh, please. A very good afternoon to all of you present here. The title of my poem is The Quest for Cordelia. The moon rose unclouded in the night sky, round and blood red. The night rang out with a jackal's cry. The wind gave tidings of the dead. We were the shadow, watching the fort from afar, silent as a black widow, spinning its web around a window bar. The time came. The clock struck one. We ran to the fort, carrying the blame of crimes in the past done. Weapons clashed, blood was shed, casting upon the floor a gory hue. Tonight, humans by the devil were led, in death, arms and legs askew. We marched into the fort's heart, crushing anyone who came our way. Our goal was Cordelia, beauty's dart. Pining for whom our king lay. We reached the chamber, pushing our way in, when ah, lit by glowing embers, we saw Cordelia right beneath our chins. As I held Cordelia, the red diamond, treasure of the neighboring kingdom, I realized human greed was hard to find. Midas was always in possession of some. I stood there among those ghastly corpses with their swords and shield raised to hit. If this was the price for Cordelia, red as roses, a doubt lingering. Was it worth it? Thank you. Thank you, Diksha. In true sense, as you said, it was a Midas touch of a medicine, medicinal person to poetry. And congratulations to you for that. Arita Samant. <laughs> Well, I'm, uh, I have written this poem about the great Irish famine which took place in the 19th century and uh, I am writing this poem as a young married woman uh, Yeah, and it depicts the plight of that woman who suffered through it and the poem is called The Potato Plight. So here I start. My husband is off to the Lord who has employed him for the fields. All the day he strains him up, at night it's potato in the meal. Oh yes, it's Mr. Britt, our Lord. In January came so many of him. He employs others like my man, but at night it po it's potato in the meal. Have you heard of Mr. Britt too? Oh, he must be an Indian or African or Vietnamese. I have heard he has colonized all the globe. Again, at night it's potato in the meal. Now Mr. Britt serves the Irish soils. Our rich crops fills him up with seal. Britain lacks this aubergine, does he yell? So, at night, it's potato in the meal. Potatoes give my man the power. Other veggies lack those vitamins. Caring Mr. Brett has told us this. So, at night, it's potato in the meal. Martha's man got recruited finally and at the dock for exports through the ships. Long live Mr. Brett who did all this and at, at night, it's potato in the meal. Oh, my man is beating me up today, for no potatoes did our land yield. I had our land while he was off to the Lord, but I found some potatoes for the meal. Canisters have all gone hollow. Lord disables us to have the chick killed. Martha's man is still recruited and I borrowed some potatoes for the meal. My man does now sit at home and calls me in the bed for the field. 
What would I serve the kids I help? So as to do, do the potatoes in the meal. Martha's man goes out every day to allow the breads to get their fill. But money helps her till when the stocks are empty and where to find the potatoes for the meal? I now lie hungry in my bed. My man's corpse lies in the landfills. Don't have strength to shed even a tear as there are no potatoes for the meal. Oh death, do I now wait for you to embrace me in my bed? We'll have to get together, it's a deal. We'll have potatoes in the meal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you dear friends. We are coming to the uh, concluding moments of this wonderful session. So dear friends, the whole... Well, I don't have their names. Are they there? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, please come. Join, join. The one with the black shirt. Come. I had these names, madam. So, yeah, please come. Good, at least some boy. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Saad Ahmed. Uh, I'm writing mostly of people who pass judgments very frequently. So, it's just about that. The title of the poem is Freedom. I was born free as the wind, wild and unbound. I was like the flowing water, making my way through uneven ground. I was the earth with the petrica. I was the undying fire, the percolating ether. Don't cage me in generalized doubts of personality. Don't tame me in world-made rituals of behavior loyalty. Don't imprison me in your mind regarding my offset behavior. Don't trap me in self-made assumptions of human nature. These restrictions put my freedom at stake, surrounded by shackles of judgment non currently made, with blots of misdemeanor on misery when you smirked at me in your pleasant reverie. But didn't we know your happiness will be fleeting? Your thoughts need much more contemplating. To savor the fruit, but trust the root. To enjoy the music and not ridicule the flute. However, the wind in me can no longer be caged. The daunting fire can rarely be tamed. A trapped fire will always be killing. And earth and ether can never be imprisoned. I will soar high in my self-made world. Away from the blotches that you do mold. I will proclaim my freedom till seven heavens high. I am free. I am free. <coughs> I will happily sigh. A very good afternoon, everyone. I feel quite a, quite uh, aged because I've got a paper to recite my poem. I'm not on my phone. The younger generation is keeping with us. So. <laughs> I'll be reciting my poem. It's titled "A Leucocytes Autobiography." I wrote it uh, around a month back um, after I read Harrison's for like four to five hours at the back page of my Harrison's. So here it goes. Deep within the bones, a place there was, small and packed, made for a cause. My father's forefathers had all worked here, leaving behind no chance for flaws. I came to life on one fine night and saw a huge megakaryo site. He said to me in his heavy voice, Welcome, you are a leukocyte. <laughs> in my home, marrow, I could see so many cells looking just like me, all waiting on the brink of a big pool of wandering RBCs. Oh boy, I sure was scared to fight those frightful bacteria and parasites. But alas, I realized I had no choice, for I was born a leukocyte. <laughs> so off I swam with all my friends in plasma, traversing loops and bends, along the path that was set for us, giggling, singing, right till the end. But one fateful day, things weren't fine. Someone had smelled a cytokine. Vigilant interleukins apprised us few bacteria had crossed the line. We praised ourselves for it was time to unleash our powerful lysozymes, which had been hungry for far too long, all brimming with their lytic enzymes. We scanned the blood from head to toe, searching for a deadly foe. 
ripping their bodies apart till they had just no chance to grow. We celebrated our Herculean win, but the bacteria had done their sin, for I realized I had been hit by their lethal endotoxin. And thus ended my glorious fight. I knew I did my duty right, but limited time was all I had. For I was but a leukocyte. Thank you so much. That's typical KEM spirit. That's the only uh, thing that I can say. What wonderful ideas. My mind uh, went back a few years back when I uh, once wrote a poem on ultrasonology, Hemangini. Just listen to that. And I gifted it to Nitin Chobar. And I don't remember the poem now, but I remember that I had titled it as. What do I good? That means the bat. Because that's what you people are when you do the ultrasound. You know? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's how the sonar things have come up from. But there are bright ideas, Dr. Zoshi. Let's think of cytochrome P450 as one of the title. You know? Forensic medicine guys can think of eternity as a title. And clinical pharmacology, antibiotics, and then you can have generations of poems. You know? <laughs> and Biju, come on, public toilet. That would be the best title that community medicine can ever have. The very purpose of this session, uh, in a busy morning, believe me, I'm to reassure the three of my meetings, but it's love for KEM. It's, it's that tremendous joy of meeting you again, seeing the bright young faces. Most of you have entered after I left KEM. And seeing that still that torch is burning, still that passion is there. Dear friends, you have realized that poetry and science today are not very different from each other. There are differences and yet there are similarities. They are poised. There is a pragmatic element in them. None of them is big. They are defined. Only thing is that the approach rules are different. But they finally take you to an eternal truth. And that is the truth about life and death. Why do I want to imbibe this on your young minds? In my life, I think poetry, literary writing, books beyond surgery have enriched my persona. But they have not only enriched, they have made me enabled to leave this life. They have enabled me in my life to take the rough with the smooth as it happens in every career. And therefore, I am going to quote here my love, late Jamjit Singhji. And there are two wonderful lessons. The first one, Describes the typical life of Mumbai through which all of us are going. There's a lot of hustle bustle, and still each one of us is lonely. There's nobody around. And it says, Kaun aega yaha? Koi na aya hoga? It's as if you are an old man sitting in the home of your flat, the doors locked. Kaun aega yaha? Koi na aya hoga? Mera darwaza hawa unne khat khataya. That's the type of solitude that almost each one of us goes through some part of the life. And believe me, what was the most tragic thing when I was dean of Naya and KM for about eight years? To see a suicidal death of one of the young residents. And I always felt, why did he end? Why did she end his or her life? Why did we fail in reaching up to her? Probably one of the answers is she or he also failed to reach up to himself or herself within. So dear friends, there would be moments of ecstasy, there would be moments of despair, there would be moments of hope, there would be moments of frustrations and failures. Nobody is immune to that. And sometimes you feel like that second wonderful gazelle which almost all of you have heard. Apni marzi se kaha is safar mein hum hai. Ruk hawaon ka jithar ka usi safar ke udhar ke hao Sometimes you feel that why the hell did I get into medicine? I felt it after MBBS, I did MS. I felt it after MS, I did MCH. I felt it after MCH, I did MRC. These are not the solutions. The solutions are not to look externally, but to look internally, within. And to externalize yourself, either in the form of a poetic writing, or in the form of an essay and share your things within to others. That's the best way to bond with each other. And that's what I expect from KEM.
hereafter. I highly it over to you. Thank you. Pandey Bhar Premala also meant that we are all travellers and we all seek the same place, some through medicine, some through medicine. As far as our medical experience goes, we were only concerned with ICUs, heart rate and medical bills. We do shudder when we have to meet a doctor but today was something completely, completely different. For a change, this wasn't a medical consultation, but this was a conversation between medicine and poetry. At the beginning, we were only admiring this hall and the seats that rose like waves and waves on us. Slowly, the hall started filling up with medical students. I think they aren't just growing up to be doctors, but poets with a scalpel and stethoscope. Because when poetry meets medicine, it can only give us eternal life. Thank you so much for this session. I thank all the speakers. I thank Dr. Sanjay Om for being here. And I thank all of you for becoming a part of this session called Poetry and Science. Uh, we also have, and guess what, we also have free passes for tomorrow's event, uh, for, for tomorrow's concert. And I would really request you to go on the website, which is gooth.tp slash ptp for registering yourself online. Thank you so much. Uh, we would also like to thank our speakers today. So, uh, Thank you.